Excuse me? So we're good? Uh, okay. Um, so the quiz, um, assurance is based on uh, primarily what three factors? Promises of God in the Bible. Promises of God. Signs of grace. Signs of grace. Testimony. Immediate testimony of the Holy Spirit. What is meant by carnal presumption as opposed to true assurance? Not come, it doesn't come from the heart, and, and, it, and it isn't um, validated or verified by outward behavior or inward attitudes of the heart. Uh, so somebody may have the assurance of salvation because of something they did at one time. You know, they made a profession of faith as a child. They went to a communicants class. They walked forward you know, for an altar call or something, and, and uh, that was the last time you know, they ever manifested any signs of of being a real Christian, and yet they believed all these decades that they are. That's just presumption. You know, I, I mentioned before, I think I had a classmate at USC who was a, you know, played the part of a strong Christian as an undergraduate, and I went off the seminary, and when I came back after a couple of years, uh, he was just out there just living the life. And I had to say to him, look, for you to think that you are still a Christian, when you won't go to church because you say the church is full of hypocrites, and you're you're, you're, you're drinking to excess and you're sleeping around. I said, that's just presumption on your part. You don't show any signs of being a real Christian. That's carnal presumption. Oh, okay, uh, three, well, what, is, what is meant by the phrase, the signs of grace and how are they to be used? And is there a book of the Bible you might go to, to as, as an example of where signs of grace are appealed to repeatedly? First John. Yeah, First John. Yeah, the one who says he's come to know him and doesn't keep the commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Okay, that's a negative application. You say you've come to know him, but you don't keep the commandments? That's not true. If you come to know him, you're going to keep the commandments, not perfectly, but characteristically, habitually. You know, if you don't confess Jesus is the Christ from chapter 5, uh, then your claim of being a Christian is not a real Christian. You have some lower view of Christ than his deity. Well, you're, you're not a real believer. Uh, so the, the, there's the, the, again, the internal hard attitudes, the external behavior, those are the signs of grace. The fact that you love the scripture, the fact that you love the people of God, the fact that you love to gather for worship, the fact that you have a burden for lost souls, the, uh, the fact that you have a zeal for holiness. These are God-given signs that the natural man cannot generate up within himself. He doesn't have a taste for and a desire for uh, the things of God. He finds him, them restrictive and suffocating uh, and, and a form of bondage. Um, all right, what are the three, sign, uh, three types of biblical law? Three types of biblical law are, what are they? Civil, ceremonial, and moral. All right, civil, ceremonial, and moral. Okay, yes. List the Ten Commandments. I assume you did that. What are the three uses of the moral law? Basis for the civil law. Okay, basis for civil law. Conviction of sin. Conviction of sin. That's the second, the tutorial, the school, school master use, and yeah, rules, of, rules of life, guide of life. Um, what do we mean by legalism? There are four, primarily four things that we mean. Seeking so, salvation by works. Salvation by works. Added to God's law. Um, extra biblical requirements. Conforming to the letter, but not the spirit. Letter, not the spirit is another, yes. Major on secondary letters. issues over primary. Yeah, secondary issues over primary. You see all, all basically you see all those in Matthew 23 as Jesus uh, denounces the Pharisees. Uh, what do we mean by Christian liberty? So it should be a negative and a positive here. We need the freedom, freedom from guilt of sin. Yeah, uh, freedom uh, from sin, freedom to obey. Uh, not freedom from the need to obey. Or freedom to do whatever I want. It's freedom to obey and serve. Uh, freedom from the bondage of, of sin. So it's freedom from bondage to 
uh, service. All right, so we're going to have to limit um, any kind of questions beyond clarification questions tonight. Uh, in other words, let's, uh, we're going to need to keep statements uh, to a minimum. Be, be, not that I don't love all of your statements, um, but the problem is we are behind and we have to catch up. And so in order to do that, we're going to need to move along. Um, all right, so we just really answered number eight. Uh, Christian liberty consists of freedom from what and to what? It's freedom from sin and for righteousness. It's freedom from guilt, wrath, and the curse of sin. Freedom from the bondage and dominion of sin, Satan, um, the dominion of the world, sin and Satan. Freedom from guilt and its effects. Freedom from corruption and all of its effects. And uh, th as we saw also um, in chapter 23 on sanctification. It's also uh, freedom from the doctrines and commandments of men, as we saw in question six. So Christian liberty is also freedom for, for the service of God and so forth and so on. All right, how, uh, number, number um, nine, how does our experience of liberty differ from that of the Christian church? Well, we suggested that the difference is one of quantity, not quality. We have more freedom in that we don't, we're not yoked to the ceremonial law. We don't have the responsibility to operate the whole apparatus of sacrifice from the things that the priest dre uh, dresses in, the labors at which they wash, uh, this incense that they burn, the sacrifices that they offer um, uh, day after day, year after year, holy day after holy day, that whole burdensome apparatus, uh, that is, uh, we are free from that because of the once for all sacrifice for Christ. There's no more repetition of the sacrificial system. Though you can go into some churches and there will be labors at which the priests wash, and there will be an altar on which the sacrifice of the mass is, is, uh, is offered, and you will see the priests dressed up in the regalia. Uh, they'll burn the incense. Uh, so there is this, um, we think, you know, um, you know, significant mistake that's being made to try to duplicate Old Testament worship as though there were continuity where really with what Jesus says in John 4, there's radical discontinuity there. There's no more temple. So that, that's, the, that's the discussion with the woman, woman at the well. There is no more temple. All right, if there's no more temple, if it doesn't make any, any difference if you uh, m uh, worship in the, the mountains of Samaria or the mountain of Jerusalem, and it was up to that point, up until the incarnation, up until Jesus came, died, and was raised again, uh, but now, Jesus says, neither Jerusalem nor in this mountain shall you worship the Father, but we, everyone is everywhere is to worship in spirit and truth. What that means then is that the temple is irrelevant and everything that goes on in the temple. And what goes on in the temple? Well, you have priests who are washing at the lavers and burning the incenses and slaughtering the animals and sprinkling the blood on the altar uh, and and so on. Uh, so all that goes away. What's left? What is the kernel that is left? Well, we'll get into that in the next chapter. Okay. Um, so we don't, uh, he also, also with the confession says that we, ought, we enjoy fuller communications of the free spirit of God than was the case of Old Testament believers. So the spirit is periodically at work. We see the spirit at work in the life of Samson and Saul and David and Elijah, but not uh, there's no obvious work of the Spirit generalized. But, you know, what we know about human nature, there must have, they must have been regenerated by the Spirit. If anyone was a believer, if they were a believer, they had to have been regenerated. Uh, but there's no obvious filling and empowering of the Spirit that comes with Pentecost and the more universal and general diffusion of the Spirit uh, the Spirit of God being shed abroad on our, uh, uh, the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, ten, what is the difference between freedom and license? So I, I, don't, I don't recall if the last time we read these, uh, these uh, sections, 
uh, but paragraph three, uh, they who upon pretense of Christian liberty to practice any sin or cherish any less do thereby destroy the end of Christian liberty, which is that being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, we might serve the Lord without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Uh, so this is the, cl the claim of the antinomians and the libertines. You know, I'm saved so I can go out and do what I want. And, and uh, I'm secure, uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, and so I have a license for sin. I have my fire insurance so I can now go out and live any way that I want. And I'm safe, I'm secure. And so this, this, is, the, this is the attitude that is being addressed uh, here. They who, on the pretense of Christian liberty, in the name of Christian liberty, they, they practice a sin or cherish any lust, you're destroying the end of Christian liberty that we would be delivered from sin, not in order to sin. Not, not turning it into a license for sin. Uh, this is a concern of the Apostle Paul. Galatians 5.13, after arguing five and a half chapters against the Judaizers who are adding um, to salvation by Christ a plus mark and a blank where you, know, you fill in circumcision and the dietary laws and, and uh, the, cl the cleansing ordinances and laws of separation and uh, that I mentioned holy days, all, all of that is being uh, put, circumcision, it's all being put back in. So it's Christ plus the law as a, as a requirement for salvation. Uh, there the Apostle Paul then says, after five and a half chapters of rebutting the, the Judaistic addition of works of the law to justification by faith alone, he says, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So you see, that, that's a possibility, and it, he's dealing with it then. It's possibility to, to take the beauty of the doctrine of justification, that you are saved by faith in Christ alone, safe and secure, and to use that doctrine as a license for sin. Well, if I'm safe and secure, then I can go ahead and do what I want. I can indulge that lust. Uh, again, uh, Jude 4, certain people have crept in unnoticed all through the centuries, by the way. It's all the way back here in the first century, who were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So they are ungodly. What are, what, are, what are they doing? They are distorting, they are corrupting, they are perverting the grace of God. They are using the grace of God as a license for them to sin, as an excuse for sin. And so this is something that, uh, that uh, has always been around and the church has always had to deal with it. And, continues to have to deal with it today. And at the time that the confession was being written, there were large numbers of people they called libertines or antinomians against law uh, who were guilty of the, the very thing that's being addressed here. Isn't right. it a denial of um, what it really means to be saved, a denial of um, regeneration and union with Christ and complete misunderstanding of what, of the work that God does in the believer. Yeah, I, I think it's a very truncated view of salvation. What are, from what are you being saved? Not just hell, but from sin, right? From sin, which keeps us in bondage. So as, you know, as the Apostle Paul says in, in Romans 7, so that you do the things you don't want to do. It's a kind of bondage. It's a, it is, a, he, Jesus says, whoever sins is a slave of sin. So, you know, what, what the way the world views freedom is just the freedom to do whatever I want to do, whatever I desire to do. That's bondage because the desires take over. They control. You become a slave to your desires, a slave to your lust. You constantly have to be feeding them. They're never satisfied. Well, you get only momentary relief from, um, from the desires of the flesh, and, and then they have to... They, have to be fed, and, and there's a law of diminishing returns that seems to be built into human nature. So more and more is needed in order to get the same level of satisfaction. And you know whether it's smoking, whether it's uh, alcohol or pornography or 
visiting prostitutes or whatever, whatever. It takes more and more. And this is the bondage. Material things, you know, you never have enough. You want the bigger house. You want the better car. You want the larger wardrobe. So uh, these, these, these idols, they're voracious. They have to constantly be fed. And, and so to be, to be saved is to be saved both from, to use our two categories, the guilt of sin and the power of sin. Guilt and power. Penalty and corruption of sin. Both of those. And to, to, to think that, that, uh, that the doctrine of salvation pr provides a license for sin is to, is to fundamentally misunderstand what you're being saved from. Yes, you're being saved from hell, but you're also being saved from corruption and bondage and slavery uh, to sin, uh, liberated from that so as you can live as God has designed us to live, that is a life of holiness and in service to God. All right, now so we move on to worship and uh, the Sabbath. Um, one of the major concerns coming out of the Reformation and um, that uh, is facing the Westminster divines is the question of is the question of worship. So if you go back to if you go back to the Reformation itself, it's, uh, it, it's been recognized uh, by the historians that whereas for Luther, the heart of the Reformation was the question of what must I do to be saved, and that's a, an equally an important question for Reformed Protestantism, but the, that really is the focal point of the Lutheran Reformation. The Genevan Reformation, or the Swiss Reformation, including Zwingli and Calvin, uh, and then the whole Reformed Church, is a different question, is how is God to be worshipped? And it's even in their testimonies. You know, Luther speaks of himself being re re reborn when he understood that he was justified by faith apart from works. Calvin speaks of himself being delivered from the bondage of idolatry. That's the way he relates his, his own conversion. And, and so whether we're talking about the, the fight with the, uh, the Roman Catholics, the, the debate with the Roman Catholics about how is God to be worshipped and the sim simplifying of worship at the time of the Reformation, or for the next you know, 100 years after Protestantism is established in, uh, Eng in England, um, let's say mark it from the first prayer book of, of, uh, of Edward, uh, Edward the First in 1547. For the next hundred years, the battle in England is over worship. I mean, uh, it's also over church government, but at the heart of it is the prayer book and whether or not uh, the prayer book is, is an adequate guide for or rule, even rule for the worship of the people of God. So you have the Puritans against the Anglican establishment who want the church reformed along Genevan lines, not continuing um, to carry over from the Middle Ages and Roman Catholic practice into the Reformation era the practices and the symbols and gestures and ceremonies of medieval Catholicism. So that battle goes on for a hundred years. Uh, and then there's the Puritan Revolution and the Westminster Confession and the Directory of Worship and they, they then determined to reform the church along more Genevan lines and the whole settlement that gets thrown out when Charles II comes back, except in Scotland and among the Congregationalists and Baptists, then the non-conforming brethren then continue uh, to, to worship uh, along uh, 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 the simple lines that uh, are al along Gen the Genevan practices. All right, so question number um, 11, is God pleased with every act of sincere worship which might be offered to him? By what is acceptable worship regulated? All right. The light of nature showeth that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and doth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart, with all the soul, with all the might. What, what shows that to be true? The light of nature. You ought to know that by living in God's world, the heavens declare his glory, you ought to know this. 
It's saying that everybody ought to know this. You know, Romans 1, his invisible attributes, the eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen, being understood so that they're, by what has been made so that they are without excuse. Everyone should know that there's a God. Everyone should know that he's sovereign. And everyone should know that he is good and that he's to be feared and loved and praised and called on and trusted and served with all the heart and with all the soul with all the might. So that, that, should be, that is ingrained in humanity. And, and it, uh, it, that truth explains, we might argue, the religious impulse that is universal. Everywhere you go, you see humanity is religious, incurably religious. Um, and, and even our modern secularism, uh, in effect, gets replaced by other, other gods uh, and false gods of a non-theistic sort, but nevertheless um, become gods uh, 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 of a non-theistic nature. All right, but the acceptable, getting to the point here, but the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is... instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation, that's an appeal to the second commandment, or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. What, what did we call this principle? Regulative. All right, right. It's what Presbyterians call the regulative uh, principle. Um, so the question here is, is he pleased with every sincere form of worship that might be offered to him? The answer that you ought to be given is? No. No. And it's, a, it's, it's repeated. It's instituted by himself. And because instituted by himself, it's revealed, uh, limited by his own revealed will. And so he is only to be worshiped in ways prescribed in the Holy Scripture. So, so, and behind this is, you know, the doctrine of sin. We don't know what God, what pleases God. We're fallen. Uh, we are inherently uh, idolaters. Calvin in the Institute speaks of, of uh, the human heart being a factory of idols. We are idolatrous by nature. That's the point of Romans 1. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. We worship the creature rather than the creator. We recreate God in our own image. Uh, and, and so we can't rely upon our own thoughts, uh, our intuitions, uh, our um, common sense in order to try to determine how God is to be worshipped. We have to go to God himself and ask him to tell us, how do you want to be worshipped? What is it that pleases you? And so you go all around the world and, you know, you have people offering human sacrifices. And, you know, Hamas thinks you serve God by, sl by slaughtering Jews. Uh, that's why they're ye uh, yelling, you know, uh, uh, Allahu Akbar, or however exactly you pronounce it. Uh, they're praising God while they're slaughtering in infants and children and, and innocent civilians. Is that, is that how God is to be served? Uh, is God to be served like uh, the, the um, you know, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel as they are mutilating themselves and dripping drops of blood, pra practicing a kind of sympathetic magic, as it's called, where... You know, we drop the red blood so the gods who are fairly dumb, Baal's not very smart, so you have to act out. That's why you have temple prostitutes. You want fertility. You want the crops to grow. You want your wives to have children. Then you act out sexual acts in the high places where God, the gods can see you with the temple prostitutes. And they'll get the idea that, oh, they want, they want fertility. So we'll bless the wombs of the women and the crops in the field. And, and uh, the, the result will be, you know, healthy children and healthy crops. Uh, and if we want fire from heaven, let's drip some blood. Uh, so they'll imitate the red coming down and fire will fall down on uh, my altar. So is that how you serve God? You imitate what you got, want God to do uh, and he'll see. And no, uh, uh, the hu human, human imagination just runs rampant in conceiving of God and what God wants, uh, you know, the, Zeus and Mount Olympus and, and, and on and on it goes and goes and goes. Molech, it was infant sacrifice. You offered, dropped your children onto the red hot hands of Moloch and your infant would then roll into the hot belly of the idol and, and would be consumed by the fire. Uh, is, that, is that what God wants? No. Uh, we need to go to God's word. So paragraph two, religious worship is to be given to God, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and to him alone. 
not to angels, saints, or any other creature, and since the fall, not without a mediator, nor the mediation of any other but Christ alone. Um, so question number one, by what is acceptable worship regulated? Scripture has to be. There, can't, there can be no other standard. All right, list the elements of true worship found in 21, 1 through 6, 22, 1. See also the notes, how the directory specifies what is meant by each element in each case. Also see also in the notes of what does reformed worship consist. All right, so paragraph three, first element that's listed, prayer with thanksgiving being one special part of religious worship is by God required of all men and that it may be accepted, it is to be made in the name of the Son by the help of his spirit according to his will with understanding, reverence, humility, fervency, faith, love, and perseverance and if vocal in a known tongue. So element number one, when we get together, what is one of the activities that we engage in when we gather the people of God? We pray. Prayers to be made for all things lawful and for all sorts of men living or that shall live hereafter. But contrary to the medieval mass or the teachings of Trent or the Tridentine mass that uh, was normative right up until the middle 1960s, not for the dead. Why not? because the dead are in eternity. They're even in heaven or they're in hell. There is no purgatory, so a prayer for the dead does no good. Their eternal destiny has already been determined. You would pray for the dead if they were in purgatory and you thought your, their prayers would do them some good, but there's no purgatory, and so there's no use praying for the dead. Their, their, um, uh, their eternal uh, location is fixed. Uh, Quick question on... Uh, the end of number three of, of point three, the known tongue, is that just a rebuttal against lat, like prayers in Latin? Or is it also, does it have anything to do with glossolalia? No, it's about Latin, right? It's, a, it's the rationale for translating uh, the Bible into English and the service into, well, in, into the vernacular, whatever the vernacular may be. So the medieval mass, the Tridentine Mass was in Latin until the 1960s, all right? Middle 1960s, you still got every, everywhere you go in the world, you have the same service, exactly the same service in Latin. And uh, so the average person, uh, you know, just doesn't know what's going on. Though, um, though um, what was her name? Mother, Mother uh, I forget her name. Uh, anyway, one of these uh, Roman Catholic nuns, what's, it's sort of funny, he said, Sanctus, 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 what's so hard to understand about that? All right, so yeah, I mean, holy, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah you can understand a word, but for the most part, people just don't know what's going on. They, they don't know Latin, they don't know, this is, this is how you end up with hocus pocus, by the way. In, in, in hoc signu, what is it, in hoc, in, no, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's Constantine. Um, oh, I can't remember what it is. In, in, Hocus, in, in hoc, in, um, say it Something about this, this is my body. Yeah, my cor body. corpus meum is the last part of it. Um, hocus. Right. Hocus, corpus meum, something like that. Anyway, the, an average person sitting out in the, in the congregation heard hocus pocus, and so that became the magic. I mean, the, the magic that turns the, the, the bread into the body of Christ and the wine into the blood of Christ. I mean, you could take that magic out. If you repeat those magic words, you can do magic. Uh, Hocus corpus meum, I think it is. Uh, this is my body. Is that Latin right, Ben? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Not for the dead, nor for those to whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. We'll just pass over that. Uh, number two, second element, the reading of the scriptures with godly fear. Uh, pro maybe, maybe the most neglected element. If you look at the evangelical world generally, the most neglected element would be the reading of scriptures. I mean, we didn't read the Bible in churches I grew up in, except a couple of verses that were the basis for the sermon, which was usually a verse or maybe two verses, and they were evangelistic. But uh, this is what was so 
um, unsettling for me is I, you know, I started attending Anglican churches, and I remember one in particular, St. Mary's Redcliffe in Bristol, a church in which Whitfield had been denied access in order to preach at one point, and then they later invited him to come in. Uh, but uh, sitting out uh, there in the congregation and uh, the prophet Isaiah being read, and it was really, really well read uh, with, with right nuance and emphasis, and it was powerful. The reading itself was powerful. And I remember thinking, you know what? I've never heard the Bible actually read in a worship service in the church. Churches I grew up in and, and attended. I just thought, isn't that ironic? We believe in the inerrancy of scripture, but we don't read the Bible. We, we preach on a couple of verses, but the whole, you know, whole, the whole span of the Bible is neglected. I mean, the bulk of it is just neglected. We never hear it. And I just thought, you know, there's, some, there's something wrong with our doctrine of scripture and our doctrine of worship if we don't systematically read through the Bible. So the, but the confession, it, it identifies it as one of five elements. There's only five, and it's one of them. You're supposed to read the Bible. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.13 says, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. You're supposed to do this, uh, and yet it's not. It's inexplicable to me. Uh, uh, the sound preaching and conscionable hearing of the word. So number three is preaching uh, in obedience unto God with understanding, faith, and reverence. Singing of psalms. Uh, that, there's number four. Uh, now, uh, the authors that I have, uh, I have cited in, in your notes uh, believe that the word psalms there is not meant to communicate exclusively, that it was uh, a term that would have been used more broadly for the biblical book of psalms and, uh, as well as for you know, uh, paraphrases of other scripture and scripture-based hymns. Um, but the con congregational singing is another element. It was another element that was, well, let me back up. In the readings in the medieval and tridentine, well, not the tridentine, but the, but the medieval mass, the Old Testament was not read except for the Psalms. So with the reforms of worship, there was the introduction of the reading of Old Testament books as well as New Testament books. So you're getting much broader uh, biblical uh, li literacy. Um, and, and then the, uh, the, the preaching of uh, the scriptures and the singing, congregational singing then, uh, was revived. So it was a part of the practice of the, of the patristic church. It died out in the Middle Ages, but uh, the Reformation revived congregational singing. Uh, and uh, so it, it is understood to be an element, along with preaching and the reading of scriptures and prayer, as, a, as one of the five elements that, uh, or activities. Again, what, what is it that we do when we get together? Well, we sing. We sing praise. And it's congregations. So the singing part of the service was being rescued from cathedral and monastic choirs, which did the singing part of the service during the Middle Ages. And rightly, the reformers understood, no, congregations are supposed to sing. Vatican II recognized this, and it promoted congregational singing. Vatican II recognized the neglect of preaching and, and uh, promoted preaching. Vatican II recognized that the, the, uh, uh, that the prayers uh, were not comprehensive in, in the Tridentine Mass and so expanded the, the prayer life of the, of the Catholic Church. So many of these reforms end up being implemented by Vatican II so that 500 years later they actually do recognize that the Reformation got a lot of things right when it has to do with worship. Now, didn't, now, they didn't touch their sacramental theology. We'll get on to that. But in terms of reading scripture, preaching, uh, expanded prayer uh, repertoire, and congregational singing, those reforms are all embraced by Vatican II, remarkably. Um, all right, the singing of psalms with grace and heart, also the due administration and worthy receiving of the sacraments instituted by Christ are all parts of the of crucial word, great Presbyterian word, the ordinary religious worship of God, and then irregular elements, religious oaths, vows, solemn fasting, thanksgivings upon special occasions, which, which are and in their several times and seasons to be used in a, a holy and religious manner. Okay, so what are those uh, elements? The word is read, preached, prayed, sung, made visible in the sacraments. 
Okay, yes. And uh, so let me, let me back up and, and first before, um, before we, we d deal with the elements themselves, let me offer some further clarifications on number 11. Um, the regulative principle Extra biblical, in the normative principle, I want to contrast the normative principle, which is understood by other Protestants and, you know, essentially by the Roman Catholics as well, that they would argue that extra biblical rituals and ceremonies and postures and gestures and holy days and pictures and statues and so forth, because they would argue they can find no prohibition for these extra biblical things that we do, that they do, that they're permitted. So that, that would be the normative principle. It's a, it's a much broader view of what's allowed. If it's not forbidden, it's permitted. We say in the regulative principle, if it's not authorized, it's forbidden. So we want a positive example. We want a positive bit of instruction, a positive principle in the Bible that directs us to do a thing or we think it should not be done. They think, well, if it's not prohibited, we can do it. Now well, we got these rituals, they're harmless. We have these ceremonies, they're harmless. We've got these altars. Well, you know, we understand that the altars just point to Christ, don't we? We all understand that. Um, uh, you, you know, we, we bow to the east. We know that, you know, we, we, we cross ourselves. So we, we genuflect. We, we do all these things. We can retain these things. The Anglicans are saying we can retain uh, these uh, elements of the medieval mass. The Roman Catholics are defending them vehemently. The Lutherans are, they're, uh, they're, they're retaining a number of these elements as well. The Reformed are saying, no, if it's not authorized in scripture, it doesn't belong in the worship of God. It needs positive authorization. Um, in your notes, you've got uh, this, uh, this, uh, this citation from the larger catechism. Um, and uh, then the scriptural basis, uh, really the, the locus classicus, as they say, the text is the second commandment. Why not, uh, why not, um, you know, why not have a, some kind of, of, of a representation, an image, a symbol for, for God? Uh, the bottom line is, because God says not to. You shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness in heaven above or earth below and so forth and so forth. Well, why not? That's helpful. Those images, they help me. They help me to focus my mind. My mind wanders. And so it helps to have a little picture of Jesus or have a, some kind of a symbol of God of some sort or another. Uh, why not do it? Well, because the second commandment says no. Why does it say no? Just because that's what God says. Uh, we, could, we could push that further, but um, basically that's what. Okay, so number 12, here are the ordinary elements. Prayer, reading of scripture, preaching, singing of psalms, and the administration of the sacraments. And then periodic oaths, fasts, uh, thanksgivings. All right. And then I want to digress further. Issues resolved then by the directory for public worship. Now remember, this comes out a couple of years before the confession. So when the confession is being written, in the back of their mind is the directory. It came out in 44. Uh, the confession is published in 46, 47. Um, and so it is elaborating on exactly what is wanted and what is meant. And the writers of the confession are assuming a knowledge of the directory. So a number of the things uh, that are authorized, liturgical use of the Lord's Prayer, uh, marriage as a, as a part of worship but not a sacrament, the reading of a chapter of each testament of scripture in each of the two Sunday services. In other words, you should have an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, Sunday morning and Sunday night, an entire chapter of each, ordinarily. That's a pretty substantial commitment to Bible reading. Um, it provides models of free biblical prayer. So there's a prayer of praise, there's a prayer of confession of sin, and then in a lengthy uh, past, what we would call the pastoral prayer. Uh, it, uh, it authorizes the singing of psalms and likely biblical hymns. Preaching is defined as an exposition of a text of scripture. So it's not just a, it's not just a lecture on a religious topic. It is an exposition of a Bible passage. 
and is even specific in saying that the congregation should see that the doctrine being preached arises out of that text. In other, the preacher should be showing, I am getting what I am saying right out of that passage. Uh, rejection of holy days except for the weekly uh, Sabbath, and then ordained leadership in the administration of the sacraments, preaching, reading scripture, and prayer. Uh, it's another, another principle that's being um, frequently uh, 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 being violated today that's in the directory. So what, what is, you know, we have worship leaders today, you know, that's a very popular thing, and typically they're musicians, and they're typically, dare I say, theologically illiterate, and uh, minimal biblical knowledge often, and they're up front, and they're leading, sometimes they're teenagers, often they're women. We, we, even at General Assembly, we will get together 3,000, you know, ministers, and, and uh, we'll be led up front by teenagers and women, and uh, the unordained are up there leading, and leading, my opinion, poorly, um, but that, that's, uh, that's, that's not what's envisioned by the directory, that's not what's envisioned by the confession. It's the ordained, what are you ordained to do? You're ordained to preach. And to read the Bible correctly, you need to understand it. So who's the best equipped to read the scripture? Well, somebody that's been trained in the scriptures so that he understand the nuances of the passage. And who's to administer the sacraments? Only the ministers can administer the sacraments. Who should be leading in prayer? I think it's only because we have devaluated, uh, devalued prayer that we think just anybody, we can just get anybody to stand up and, and lead in prayer. Whereas if you're properly praying, your prayers are going to be theologically, biblically rich. And that takes some, you know, some training. Um, so uh, hymn selection, I would never turn that over to a musician, ever. I mean, I'm gonna do that. I'm, I've got, I've got I, I think that the, the songs and hymns and spiritual songs are meant to be edifying. And so I'm, I'm gonna pick ones that I think are going to edify the congregation. And I think that I'm, uh, the, I think the ordained leadership is best equipped to determine which are the most edifying for uh, the congregation. All right, issues not addressed, use of, use of musical instruments, they are not forbidden, uh, it's not addressed at all. Um, further, uh, details of issues resolved by the directory continuing. Um, six basic genres of biblical prayer uh, are, are, are um, described, and then the importance of free prayer is underlined by the directory. So the, the, the genres are praise, confession of sin, and assurance of pardon, thanksgiving, and the petitions or intercessions, so the, the classic fivefold. Uh, by the way, you can hear this in every one of our services. The fivefold sanctification, church and its ministry, the sick, the civil magistrates, and mission, prayer of illumination before the reading or the preaching, and then the benediction at the end. What's meant by free prayer? Uh, not reading a written prayer. They, they are, this is one of the major points of contention between the Puritans and the Anglicans. As they, they believe that, uh, that, the, that the, 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 the requirement that you only use the prayers in the prayer book was suffocating the gift of free prayer. I had no idea what that meant until I went and t uh, I attended the Buckingham Baptist Church in Bristol and a man by the name of Ron Clark stood up and led us in prayer. And his prayer was rich with Bible and it was urgent and fervent and powerful. All I'd ever heard was these dreary short prayers and boring prayers. And this guy's prayers were absolutely dynamic. And I thought, hmm, there, that's, that's what's meant to be. That's the Puritan tradition. Uh, that's why they will talk about so-and-so prayed for an hour and it was thrilling to my soul type of thing. Okay, so summary, moving along here, summary, uh, what does the directory reform worship consist of according to the directory? Lectio continua reading of substantial portions of scripture. All right, ordinarily a chapter of each testament, each service. Here's the language about expository pre preaching. Ordinarily the subject of the minister's sermon is to be the same uh, text, uh, is to be the same text of scripture Care is to be taken that the doctrines preach be truths contained or grounded in that text. That was what I was just saying. That's the language. That the hearers may discern how God teaches it from thence. Not that he teaches it generally, but you're getting it out of that passage. A full diet of biblical prayer. 
We've just seen th those elements. The singing of biblical psalms and hymns. It is the duty of Christians to praise God publicly by singing of psalms together in the congregation, also privately in the family. And then frequent administration of the covenantal sacraments simply without adding any other ceremony. So not, don't, encum don't encumber baptism and the Lord's Supper with all sorts of distracting rituals and ceremonies. I think even don't parade the baby up and down the aisle. So everybody goes, Ooh, you know, and the group of the women all cry and all of that. No, no, it's just a simple washing. A simple washing. You pour the water you pray in, the, in the name of the Trinity and then you pray for the child. So frequent is the word that's used. It's not defined. So it's the opposite of infrequent. Uh, but it's not every week. It, do, it doesn't uh, require that. All right, question number 13. How is the regulative principle clarified relate elements to circumstances and forms? So if you were following the enumer enumeration in 1.6, then what you will find, going back to 1.6, is you're going to see a category that addresses an, el a, a, an aspect of worship. Um, so it starts by saying the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for faith and life, et cetera, be found in scripture or may be deduced from scripture. Um, however, There are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the church common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word which are always to be observed. Then when it speaks of the Lord's Prayer, it speaks of it as a form of prayer. And so what we're able to discern from the Westminster documents is a th threefold uh, division of the addressing the worship of God and the activities of that worship into three different uh, categories, that of elements, forms, and circumstances. So this is, um, this is the answer to number 13. Elements, so what are the elements? Well, it's those five we just looked at, right? You read the word, preach the word, sing the word, pray the word, display the word in the sacraments. So those are the five. Um, what are the forms? Well, the, take prayer. A prayer can be, it can be a written prayer. It can be a short prayer. It can be a long prayer. It can be a prayer of praise. It can be a prayer of confession of sin. It can be a prayer of petition. Uh, it can be a prayer of benediction. So th those are matters of form. There's a lot of latitude about the form that the prayer takes. It could be five minutes. It could be five hours. So that's a, that's a wisdom issue about what form it takes at any given moment. So there's a considerable latitude there about, about um, you know, the sermon. What kind of sermon is going to be preached? Is it going to be a topical sermon? Is it going to be a sequential, at lectio continua sermon? Is it going to be a two hour sermon, a one hour sermon, a five minute sermon? You have, again, that's, that's a matter of form, but it's a sermon. Uh, uh, circumstances, uh, well, that has to do with how you project the voice. That's not a new issue. So the design of the interior, so the, the time of the Reformation, they brought the pews around the pulpit. Rather, you think of, uh, uh, think in terms of the, uh, you know, the medieval cathedral, beautiful though it be, uh, the medieval cathedral, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's built like this and you've got this aisle down the middle and then long rows of seating all the way back and you've got this altar way up here and the people are back here they can, can't hardly hear what's going on but it doesn't matter because it's in Latin anyway they're just gazing forward at the mystery of the mass um, and so it, it, it you know it's not really it doesn't really make any difference you just it, it's just the, they just need to know what the, what's going on is proper and then they receive the, uh, the, the bread and that's for their edification and there's likely to be no preaching in the service at all Okay, so the, the reformers take over these cathedrals in Protestant lands, and what do they do? They move the pulpit over here. 
You go to St. Peter's today in Geneva, and that's what you'll see. Here's the pulpit, and then they bring pews around over here and over here. What are they doing? They're getting the cathedral to serve auditory purposes. And they turn, turn the, you know, adjust the pews and everything else so that now it all revolves around this way. And then when they can design their own churches, um, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to take out the altar and put in the pulpit, and you're going to have pews gathered around the pulpit. This is uh, true of the churches built after the Great Fire of London in 1666. The Christopher Rhenish style of architecture was serving auditory purposes. So St. Martin's in the field is an example, at least as it was originally designed, which had a great influence on the architect who designed our interior. So you'll notice our pews come around. The balcony comes all the way around. And we have got pews on the side. We've got them angled on the walls and then, uh, the, the, then straight down the middle so that everybody is in a position to hear what the preacher is saying. And there's a dome that carries the voice because hearing is essential. So that's a circumstance. Is, um, what, what, uh, what is to govern the circumstances? It's, uh, well, 1-6 says Christian prudence and the general uh, rules of the word. You need to make a decision. How are you going to ensure that people can hear? They used to put sounding boards over the head. You see this in older churches, sounding boards over the head. We have spent tens of thousands of dollars to try to get the speakers right in, in the interior because our building was built before there was the internal combustion engine uh, or air conditioners uh, that, that to fill the air with noise and compete with the voice. And so, and when the building's empty, I can whisper in the pulpit and you can hear me all the way in the back. It's like the Capitol Dome. Fill it with people and you've got these dead spots right in the middle. If you sit on the aisle in the middle um, and you will, you're likely to hear an echo and have trouble hearing what's being said unless somebody has an especially clear voice. So, uh, um, you know, lighting, that's a circumstance. So, uh, circumstance regarding all gatherings of people. That's what 1-6 is saying. All gatherings of people have to make decisions about how do you project the voice, how do you provide illumination or lighting, um, how do you arrange the seating. Um, these are determined by Christian prudence. So if somebody comes along and says, Hey, wait a minute. You all say you're, you know, you're, you're worship, but you only do what's in the Bible. Where, where are pews in the Bible? That's a circumstance. Where are hymn books? That's a circumstance. How do you provide texts for people? If you want them to sing, what are they going to sing? How do you provide the text? How do you, um, uh, you know, if you want them to sing, don't you need to have books for them to sing out of? That sort of thing. So these are all circumstances, uh, that, you know, lights. And, and so on. So that's what's behind question number 13 as an as a attempt to clarify what we mean when we're talking about the regulative principle. It's not, it's not ridiculous. It's not absurd. It's not as though we're, uh, we, we have this uh, unworkable principle. No, we, we think that there's, there, we're real strict about elements. There's latitude when it comes to forms. And then it's really common sense, sanctified common sense, Christian prudence when it comes to circumstances. Uh, 14, who ought to lead in worship and what do the directories say about qualifications? 14. Yep. Right. Yeah, really touched on that already. It's uh, meant that uh, we would have ordained leadership uh, in, in, in the church. Uh, both the directory for church government and the directory for ordination, as well as the directory for worship, uh, envision that uh, the ministers are leading in prayer, they're reading scripture, they're preaching, they're administering the sacraments. Not even ruling elders are envisioned filling these tasks. Uh, these are the duties. This, it is for the, to fulfill these duties that the church ordains its ministers. Um, all right, and uh, uh, what is acceptable prayer? Uh, you will have, uh, I'm sure you will have looked carefully at the language. I think it's rich, uh, rich language about what kind of prayer is 
uh, is acceptable and uh, instructive for us. Let me get back to the, uh, that question. So it, uh, it says uh, it's offered to the Father through the Son by the help of the Spirit. That little formula we use is right there in the, con in, in, uh, the, in the, in the confession. We pray to the Father through the Son by the help of the Spirit. It's to be offered with sincerity and faith for things lawful, for all sorts of people, but not for the dead. And then the Westminster Divines provided extensive direction for prayer in the larger and shorter catechisms with expositions of the Lord's Prayer. You're aware of that, I assume. So extensive, extensive devotion, uh, uh, a commitment to instruction on, on prayer. What are the three, number 16, regular occasions of worship named in 21.6? Evaluate your own practice in light of this. So for the first time ever, family worship uh, takes on confessional status. So God is to be worshiped in private, in homes, and as a congregation. So family worship by the confession gets elevated to confessional status. All right, let's take a break. <laughs>